Hello there, my name is Brenda Holmes Stanchu, and I am joined here by Lisa Hoda and Victoria Rick, who are helping me to put this on for you all. We are at Starsmore Nature and Visitor Center here in Colorado, which is at the base of North Cheyenne Canyon. And we are going to be talking about one of my favorite Colorado animals. I love to talk about all Colorado animals, but hummingbirds are definitely my favorite. Um, years ago, I started doing research and that made me more and more interested. And I wanted to be able to teach you so that you can become a teacher to your friends and your family and you can be giving facts out. Uh, remember, not everything that you read in print is a fact. You have to be a scientist and do your own research and find out all of the cool things about all different things, but especially these uh, very special birds. So, Hummingbirds can fly like this, but that's how lots of other birds fly. So that is not the super cool thing about them. They can also fly backward. They can also do front flips. They can also do back flips and they can fly upside down. When they are doing that, they are not going to fly all the way from Mexico upside down. That wouldn't make much sense, would it? But their bodies are shaped so that they have incredible muscles right here okay in colorado we will get about four different hummingbirds to visit but in the united states we get about all of these different kinds of hummingbirds but in north south and central america there are over 300 kinds of hummingbirds and some of the hummingbirds are going to be very muted colors because they want to be able to hide and they are called hermits some hummingbirds are going to have curved beaks because of the types of flowers that they choose from. Some of them are going to have very long tails for display and also because of the noise that they can make. Some hummingbirds are large. This puppet is very large and it would be about the size of a giant hummingbird that does not come to Colorado. There are also hummingbirds that are extremely small like a bumblebee hummingbird that really only lives in Cuba. So the hummingbirds vary incredibly in their size, their coloring, and their shapes, but they all have incredible uh, muscles on their wings to enable them to do the fantastic flying that they do. The hummingbirds that come to Colorado are all about the same shape and size, um, from four inches to about three and a half inches. And they are going to have extremely small feet, and these feet are used only to perch. If they wanna be able to fly just this far, they are going to use their wings. They're not going to be walking along branches or you won't see them walking on the ground. Their feet are very small to help them conserve uh, their uh, energy to be able to fly. And they also have these very long straight feet because of what they choose to eat. And I'll show you some of those things, okay? So, our hummingbirds are not this big, but the puppet certainly helps to um, show you the different ways that they're going to be moving. So in Colorado, the four main kinds that we get to come are the calliope, which happens to be the smallest hummingbird that even enters the United States. It has this, the male has this beautiful gorget, which are the neck feathers that it can actually splay out. The black chin, which I would have called the purple chin, it has black, but it also has this beautiful purple. That's the male. And here we have the male Rufus, which would be coming in July. But the most common that we are going to be getting is the broad tail. And the broad tail male, has this absolutely gorgeous reddish pink coloring, but this reddish pink coloring is only going to show if it is sitting and the sun is uh, hitting those feathers in such a way that they are able to shimmer and shine. These birds, if they are going to be in the shade, this magical color can turn blackish or greenish and make them look very dull and they'll be able to be camouflaged a little bit better. The males will often sit on the end of a branch and be displaying those neck colors um, in the sun. They're very iridescent. But one of the things I wanted to show you about this broad tail is this last feather right here. 
that spacing on the feather is what makes the trilling noise that in Colorado makes it easier for us to be able to find the hummingbirds. As our male hummingbirds are moving around, you're able to hear a noise. Now for me, the male broadtail sounds like a cricket. So what I hear is rrr, 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 and the male is using that sound to display both to the other males and to show off to the females. He's using his neck feathers and that noise to say, look at me, I'm very strong, I'm handsome, and don't you think I would make a great boyfriend? That is basically his goal right now. Okay? The um, Rufus, when he arrives in July, can also make a noise. To me, it sounds more like a bumblebee, and that's because of that tiny little space on the end of their wings. Um, the black chin and the calliope do not have that space, so they can't make that noise. So we're spoiled by being able to hear our male hummingbirds as they are wandering through um, the leaves trying to find their best territory. All right. So the females of all of those species are going to want to be more camouflaged because they are the ones that are going to be sitting on the nest. Now we do have many broadtails moving around as we're doing this, and you may not be able to hear them, but as you are out hiking, I want you to be able to train yourself so that you can help adults to hear it, because often children can hear it way better. Once you know what the sound is, you'll hear them everywhere. All right, so you can be listening as we are working here, but remember that noise is only made by the male. The females do not have that space on their wings, so they can't make that noise. But all hummingbirds can talk. And quite honestly, to me, it sounds like they're arguing. It sounds like da 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 And they can choose to talk or not. So when they are going up to flowers or feeders, they will either be quiet if they want to be stealth and sneaky, or they will announce their presence. So be listening for that also. So because I can't call the hummingbirds over to sit on my fingers, and to show off for you, I wanted to show you some pictures and have you try to figure out, based on what you've already learned, is this a male or is this a female? Okay. I want you to notice how these long feathers are here, this gorget. This is that calliope, and this is definitely a show off hummingbird. This is not one trying to hide. This is that male calliope. So you can see he does not have the spaces here and he is very small. So if you get used to looking at hummingbirds a lot and all of a sudden notice one that looks like a teenager, it could be that calliope. So just be paying attention to that, okay? So my question to you, is this a male or is this a female based on what you've already learned? Well, you probably noticed right here automatically, here is that bright red, but here is, it's black. And that's because the sun is reflecting right here and that is showing that broad tail male this is that black or dark green color that it can become. And here is that space on the wing that allows the hummingbird to make that loud noise. Okay. So again, is this a male or a female? Well, it looks pretty dull, looks pretty camouflaged. But if you look here, here is that dark spot. The females are going to have white with freckles. And here you can see one of its main food sources. So this is going to be, again, that male broad tail, all those different colors that it can be. Now here we have two hummingbirds feeding off of the same food source, but there is not that big dark spot. Here you see those freckles, still an absolutely gorgeous bird, but here are two females feeding off of the same flower. You can see how tiny their feet are there. And this picture I find interesting because it looks like the hummingbird has no wings. So the wings are moving so incredibly fast that it is hard to even capture it on film. Here you have some new feathers that are growing in. That's what those, new, those white spots are. And look how dull those beautiful pinkish red feathers can be when the sun is not reflecting right. The broad tail gets its name because of its tail being um, kind of extra long. And compared to a ruby throat, which would be more on the East Coast, it's a larger bird. And of course, it gets to make that noise. Okay. 
the hummingbirds, when they are flying, not only can they do those front flips and those back flips and move incredibly fast, dodging and darting, but they can do their very special trick of hovering. So you will see them go up to different flowers and bushes and trees, and it looks like they are like a helicopter and they're moving their wings incredibly fast, but it appears that they're moving like this. But actually their wings are moving in a figure eight pattern, infinity. It is amazing that their wings can do that and they are the only bird that can do that. When you see hawks hovering over a field looking for prey, the hawk is actually moving its wings like this, but the hummingbird is doing that figure eight motion incredibly fast and that takes a lot of energy. So the hummingbird, because it's moving these muscles so much, has to eat a lot. Okay? And the hummingbird has discovered that there is some very good food hiding within flowers. It is not pizza, it is not peanut butter and jelly, but there's sugar water in there called nectar. And drinking that sugar water is going to allow them to have a lot of that good energy that they need. And they have to visit lots of flowers because they need to drink a lot of sugar water to help them to have that energy. They know that lots of flowers are going to have that sugar water, but they have been trained to look for those long skinny flowers because they often have more sugar water. So those flowers often can be orange or bright pink or red. So guess what the hummingbird's favorite colors are? Can you hear? I hear over here a male talking and he's also doing that brr, brr. So I'm hoping that you're able to hear that also. The hummingbirds are going to be looking, especially when they first arrive. For us here in Colorado, the broadtail arrives uh, early to mid-April, and those males are looking for territories. And those of you that are familiar with Colorado know that that time of year, we often get some pretty big snowstorms. So there are not going to be a lot of those flowers out. So they are definitely looking for those bright colors. And often they will come up to things that are not I know myself, I was wearing a dark green sweatshirt that had a pink zipper, and I could hear that male coming, and he was going up and down my zipper, hoping to find some sugar water. I was at my home out on my deck, and I was eating pizza. And if you think of the colors that are on pizza, the hummingbird flew over to where I was eating the pizza and it was trying to find some sugar water which of course there wasn't any there. So hummingbirds have trained themselves to definitely be looking for those bright colors to be able to get a lot of that sugar water. When they drink that sugar water, that's going to give them lots of energy. So sometimes the hummingbirds want to guard, whether it's going to be someone's flower field or a fake flower, they're going to sit near it. And when another hummingbird comes to try to eat out of it, they're going to chase each other. So you're going to see some of that fancy flying. They might even use their feet to try to pull some feathers out, but they're defending their territory because if this hummingbird says, you know what, I think I'm going to share with everyone. Anyone who comes in, they can have something to eat. And if this hummingbird says, sure, take a drink. Sure, go ahead, you have a drink. When that hummingbird, a few minutes later, they have to eat every few minutes when he goes to eat, it's possible that that flower does not have any more nectar in it for that day. So especially during droughts and things like that, the hummingbirds have to protect, otherwise they are not able to survive. Our hummingbirds in Colorado are typically coming from areas of Mexico. So migration is a dangerous thing. They, we are told by the banders that they come here because it is a better place for them to be able to breed. They would have too much competition in the areas of Mexico where they are from. So they make that pretty hard trip to come here. So they are going to definitely want to defend what they think is theirs. Okay? So the hummingbirds are going to be drinking sugar water, which gives them lots of energy, just like if you ate a granola bar or something like that. But they can't just eat sugar water. If they just ate sugar water, the hummingbird would it cannot survive just on sugar water. 
just like if you were to wake up in the morning and your grown-ups said, okay, it's breakfast time, they put a bowl of sugar in front of you, you would look at it and say, hmm, this is kind of an exciting day. You ate that sugar, you would have lots of energy, you would be running up and down the sidewalk trying to climb trees, but lunchtime would come and you would go to eat that sugar again by dinner time. How would your stomach feel? Your body would be telling you, this is not good. I need to have more than just this. So if the hummingbird eats just sugar, it cannot survive. So it has to eat something else to make it big and strong, something with protein and vitamins. So as the hummingbird is sitting on a branch, you might see it pop up and pop up and dash and dart or go up to bushes that have no flowers and you're wondering why it is flying around, obviously grabbing something, or it might go up to spider webs and grab insects that have been already caught. It might even eat small spiders. So you'll see this dashing and darting. And that is a hummingbird eating something very important for it, and those are insects. And as I said, if the hummingbird does not eat those, it will die. So you can help teach your grownups that. They probably did not know that was something they needed to do. So I have a pretend hummingbird here, and he's pretty big, and I've already given you a hint, but hopefully because of things that you've already learned, you know that this is a male hummingbird. Okay? He has that beautiful color on his neck that can change depending on the light that is hitting it. And he has eaten a lot of insects, but he needs a good drink so that he can have the energy that he needs to have. And he cannot eat out of my tiny little flowers here. So we have a long flower that is perfect for him. And I'm hoping you understand why this flower is so perfect for this hummingbird. It's long and skinny. So the hope of this hummingbird is that it's going to have more sugar water in it than something like a dandelion. And it, can find the flower quickly because of the color. So this hummingbird is going to fly over and it is going to stick its beak into the flower. Now, why does the flower want the hummingbird to come visit? Is the flower just being kind or does the flower have a different plan? So if you look at the top of the flower, something is getting dusted all over the top of the hummingbird's head. So as the hummingbird is flying to a flower, the flower is using the hummingbird as a taxi. So little bits of the yellow pollen are going to attach itself to the hummingbird's head. And when the hummingbird goes and visits another flower, it's going to help pollinate. So the hummingbirds are being used to do that. And there are over 17 flowers in Colorado that are only pollinated by hummingbirds. Okay? Now for this particular flower, the hummingbird has a problem. It does have a very long beak, but the beak only fits about halfway down the flower. So how is the hummingbird going to get to the sugar water that is at the base of the flower? I don't know if you can hear it, but there's a female being chased by the males. The males are very interested this time of year in being able to capture as many female girlfriends as they can. So here we have that long skinny flower and I'm going to show you how that hummingbird is able to reach the sugar water at the very bottom. Hopefully you have guessed we're going to have the hummingbird be pretty rude. He's going to stick his tongue out at you. So this puppet is very good for showing the approximate length of a hummingbird's tongue. It is usually twice as long as its beak. Now I told you that years ago I was researching hummingbirds and I became more and more interested in them because of strange things like this. I had questions though, where does this tongue go when it is not being used to drink the sugar water out of a flower? So um, some of the questions I had was, does the hummingbird fly with its tongue sticking out, which obviously would be a bad idea. He would hit himself in the head. Does it curl up inside of its mouth? Does it stretch like a frog's tongue? But the truth is even stranger. The muscle of its tongue will actually split in half once it is inside of his body. So under the skin, under the feathers, so that muscle comes into its mouth 
wraps around the backs of the hummingbird's ears and attaches on its forehead. So this is where the hummingbird's tongue begins. And the only other bird that I know that has that is a woodpecker. It's called a hyoid apparatus. And this muscle attaches like this. So when you are watching a hummingbird, you can actually see their forehead moving incredibly fast. It's amazing. I love feeders like this for a couple different reasons. This all comes apart, so it's easier to clean. But as the hummingbird is sitting here on a perch, you are able to watch it for a longer amount of time. It gives the hummingbird a chance to rest, but when the hummingbird sticks its beak into the feeder, you can watch that forehead movement. And when it lifts its head up, if you're watching very carefully, you might see what looks like a thin thread um, just a, a fast movement because our eyes, quite honestly, have difficulty being able to see it. It moves so fast. Here are some pictures. This is one of a drawing that tries to describe that tongue. And here are some hummingbirds that do not come to Colorado, but it is showing the length of the tongue because sometimes it's just really hard to believe that that is. The hummingbirds are going to be carrying that pollen. Here is a male rufus. You can see that it has a little bit of that pollen on its head. Here's another one that has a, even a better picture. Here is a female with some of that yellow pollen. We got a call years ago at the Nature Center from someone who thought they had discovered a new type of hummingbird. It was a yellow-headed hummingbird that they could not find in any of the books. And it was just because it had so much pollen on its head after the rain. So we talked about how the males this time of year are really showing off, very interested in getting as many girlfriends as they can. So you might see the males chasing each other even more. Here I have a female puppet. They would be uh, about the same size. So this puppet, just use your imagination that she, she would be as big as this one, but the coloring's pretty good. And this female will often be sitting kind of lower down in branches. These males love to sit on the ends of branches and show off. And this female's over here. And what you will hear in Colorado for this broad tail is he will fly over and he makes this ridiculous flying motion back and forth that sounds kind of like this. And he is hovering back and forth and back and forth desperately trying to prove to her how strong he is. And the female's either going to agree or she's going to fly out the back of the bushes. They're always kind of backing up because that male is getting awfully close. If the female is impressed, the guy's then going to do the special dive bombs that this particular bird's known for. He'll take off like a rocket and it sounds like he's going to pound into the ground, you'll hear. And you can try to stare up into the sky and find it. He is up there showing off to that female. Amazing amount of energy is used to pull off this U during this display. And if that male looks over and there's another male showing off to the female, there's probably going to be that fight display again. Okay. After all of that, if the girl is significantly impressed, she is going to make a nest. Now I want you to remember how big she is, so would it make sense for her to make a nest this large? And think of her beak, and think of the things that would be, uh, she'd be able to pick up. So it's not going to be your typical nest, okay? She's going to use all kinds of soft things. So she is going to find hair. So birds don't have hair. So she might be getting it from animals in the forest. In places like Costa Rica, where the hummingbirds, many of them don't migrate, they will just fly down while the family is having um, their lunch and their dinner, and they'll take some of the hair right from the family dog. So these birds are very daring. They know their flying skills are awesome. Um, they are going to uh, also gather seeds from the trees. Some of the cottonwoods have a lot of soft fluff that they're going to be using, and they need to attach it to a nest. So think of things that they could use for glue. Often we get some suggestions of sap and things like that, which sound like great ideas until it's a hot summer day in Colorado, and then you have a very sticky nest. 
So this is more like a sleeping bag. So she is going to go and visit the spiders. And she is going to take the spider web that the spiders have created. She steals it and she makes it into this very soft sleeping bag that will stretch as the hummingbirds grow. I have one here for you to see. It is very, very soft. It is covered, which is another thing that hummingbirds love to do with lichen. And there is hair, there is spider web, there is moss, and it is very camouflaged for very good reason. The females are also not having those display colors because they want to be camouflaged. The males are not going to help make the nest. They are not going to help feed the nestlings that come from this. She is typically going to lay two eggs. And I asked you, do you think if she's the size that she is, is she going to lay an egg that is this big? Oh my goodness, no. That would be awful, right? So typically her eggs are about the size of this. If you can imagine the nestling that would come out of that, she will often lay one egg and another egg a day or two later. It takes a lot of energy for her body to be able to create this. And the nestlings are going to be fed that sugar water and lots of insects so that they can grow very quickly. But she's doing it by herself. So here are those nestlings. Here is a female. Sometimes the females will have one or two, especially the rufous, red feathers. But here she is feeding them. Look how far down she's going into their bodies with that long beak. So she is going to be spitting up the insects. That's called regurgitation. Hopefully your grown-ups didn't feed you that way when you were young. She is going to be feeding them the insects and a little bit of sugar water so that they can grow quickly. But look how camouflaged that nest is. And when they are ready to fly off, they're going to be about the size of the mom. And they are going to uh, be the same color, coloring as the female. So they won't become, if they're a boy, they won't become those fancy colors until the next year. So here are two getting ready to fledge. So absolutely amazing. So if you want hummingbirds to come visit you, the best thing for you to do is to plant flowers that you know hummingbirds love, those long skinny ones. Some of the flowers that we have here at the Starsmore Center are because of the insects that those flowers attract because the hummingbird obviously needs to eat those insects. The other thing you could do is have fake flowers like this, a hummingbird feeder. One of the things about hummingbird feeders is this is sugar water. We like to use four to one, one part sugar, four parts water. And you wanna make it yourself with the same sugar that your family does their baking with. Okay, just make it yourself. You can make sure that it is truly dissolved but once you put it outside during the summertime, it starts to get gross. The first day, it's delicious. The second day, it's still good. But after about four or five days, the hummingbird might fly up to it and be like, ugh, that's gross. And he's going to tell all the other hummingbirds how gross your sugar water is. It's going to start to grow mold. This is food that's not in a refrigerator. And just like you would not drink lemonade that was outside for five days, the hummingbird doesn't want to either. They're going to have some problems. So make sure if you're going to want to use this, that you are changing the sugar water about every four days to make sure it stays clean enough for them. And in Colorado, we have an added problem that we have to make sure that these feeders are not left outside at nighttime. We have lots of other animals that are very interested in sugar water. So we have to be responsible. These birds are not eating at night. So we have to make sure that these feeders come inside so that we're not attracting anything, raccoons and bears. Once a bear finds this, they are very aware of the color and the smell, of course, and they're going to, we're gonna have problems and the bear is going to have problems and it's going to be the uh, fault of the person who put it out there. We had someone, who lived down the street from the center and they said, oh, bears never come to my yard. They go to my neighbor's yard, but they never come to my yard. And this is what happened to the feeder at their house. And it was the person's fault for leaving it out. 
and that causes huge problems for wildlife. At the center, normally we would be having our hummingbird day. We've had it for over 20 years on this date, the Saturday before Mother's Day. And this year we're doing it a little bit differently, but we certainly hope to go back to the old ways, but we would be making these with you. So you can make one out of a baby food jar or something similar, make a good size hole, make sure that it's not sharp, and you wanna decorate it so that the hummingbirds can find it super easy. Make it, I like to say, make it look like Las Vegas, okay? So that they can find it super easy. I'm trying to think if there's something that I haven't said. Um, one thing I like to say is that the males are going to arrive, I already said in mid-April, and then the females will start to come. Then they're going to begin to leave in, at the end of the summer, the males will leave first as they're ready. The female hummingbirds are going to leave next as they're ready. The nestlings are typically the ones who are here last and they will often be here till mid-October. So I like to keep my feeder out until two weeks after I haven't seen any hummingbirds, right? So thank you. There may be some questions hiding in the chat box. So Hi, thank you so much, Brenda. Yes, so if you have questions, this is your chance to ask. Please hop in that chat box and ask away. Um, Brenda, there was some discussion about the flowers that they like best that went on in the chat, and some people mentioned salvia, honeysuckle. Yes. Is there anything else that I know you talked about? Lots of pensamins. Um, but basically, if you go to a nursery, they should absolutely know what flowers are best for hummingbirds and butterflies. Butterflies like more surface uh, sugar water, but anything long and skinny. But pensamins, and luckily, most of these flowers are perennial. So once you have them, you can, you know, have them every year. Um, I did want to point out that this is our male Rufus who will come around July 4th. And in Colorado, he has quite a reputation. Once he arrives, there's a lot of feisty hummingbird fighting that occurs because this guy is a little smaller. He hasn't had a territory here. So that's uh, a lot of um, soap opera drama that's fun to watch. Speaking of fighting and drama, we actually have three people that ask the same question. What are the predators of hummingbirds? In Colorado, it's a little bit different. Where they are from, those other 300 plus kinds, they can actually have difficulty with large fish because the hummingbirds love to go down to the water um, and be able to take a bath because they can't use a uh, bird bath. Uh, also praying mantises, spiders, hawks that are good at going in the forest. Um, but here in Colorado and the United States, probably the biggest problems are domestic cats. I know my cat is not allowed outside. <laughs> Uh, it would get chomped, but also because cats do a lot of damage uh, to wildlife outside um, and glass windows. So mm -hmm. the, I have stickers that are reflective on my windows for that exact, it's not just hummingbirds. So I would say those are the, the top problems. And of course, habitat loss. So we have had banders come to the center and I've been lucky enough to work with many different banders here and in other parts of Colorado. And we are doing research trying to figure out the places that hummingbirds absolutely need. And so we need to protect those particular areas. So you putting uh, uh, feeders and water sources and get, uh, encouraging your neighbors to do that is going to give the hummingbirds one more place to be able to take uh, a break. If you think of the ruby throat, that's crossing the Gulf of Mexico. And so once they cross, that huge area of water, they immediately need food. And that's lots of different birds will struggle with that. I have to mention that a lot of people are commenting on all the hummingbirds they see around you. They're oh, having good, fun good. spotting them. So I'm glad that they're because it's hard to know if you can hear or see them. We we can hear them like crazy. It's so cool. It's so, so, so you, those of you who aren't in Colorado, um, we're spoiled by our feisty loud ones. 
So Hannah wants to know, <clears throat> do hummingbirds like bees and honey? Uh, hummingbirds actually cannot eat honey. There's something within the honey uh, and people, we sadly have learned this because people use honey in feeders and it was killing the hummingbird. Oh, good to know. So hummingbirds cannot eat honey. Uh, bees and wasps can cause problems at feeders. The bees and wasps have very short mouth parts. And so if you have them visiting a feeder, it's because there's sugar water on the outside of the feeder because the bees basically have to lick it off. So you just have to make sure that your feeder is kept clean. And that's another reason I like these particular feeders. They, they're they very easy to be maintained. Um, so you will see hummingbirds and wasps and bees kind of dashing and darting away from each other. So I would not say that they're the best of friends. <laughs> Mary has a great question. I live in the northern part of the city and my tap water has a bit more lead. Should I use filtered water for my feeder? Um, always a good suggestion for you and, and the birds. Uh, one of the things that um, often is suggested is just for the chlorine and different things in the water, people can boil it first if you have city water. Um, I have well water, so I just, shake it and get it really dissolved. Um, but boiling the water should help it. You can keep it in a pitcher in the refrigerator for about seven days or so, but you can check it and you'll be able to see when uh, problems start to occur. A little bit of mold, uh, little black dots, so. Um, Courtney had a couple questions. So she wanted you to remind her how long the tongue of a hummingbird is, and then do they return to the same place every year? are usually twice as long as the bee. One of the things we're trying to figure out is exactly that, do the hummingbirds return? We have banders here at Starsmore usually every August, and they get absolutely super excited when we have recaptured. So that is data that is all stored in one central location with Cornell, and they are trying to figure out exactly that. Um, are those birds repeating and coming back over and over? Uh, often you'll talk to people who feed hummingbirds and they will say absolutely. Um, it's very easy to give personality to these birds um, and people will talk about them like that. They're mean, they're feisty, they're um, angry, they're happy. Um, giving these words that often we use uh, for people to, to these animals um, but it's because of the personality that they show. And um, so that is often the females will build the nest on top of a previous nest or in the same location if she had success at the last place. But we only know this from people reporting. And there are, you can become a citizen scientist. There's lots of different sites that you can look up and you can be helping the scientist by reporting this information. Anything from reporting the first earthworm that appears, the first hummingbirds that show up, um, but that data is all correlated. So you can be one of those scientists. And it doesn't matter if you're two years old or 100 years old. There's a lot of discussion about the sugar to water ratio. So it's four parts water to one part sugar, right? In a flower, it varies pretty much four to one, five to one. So we're basically replicating what is in the actual flower. Um, in the spring, you can up the sugar content a little bit more just to give them that extra boost, but we, we don't wanna go anything more than that. Okay. There's a question, do we know how long the wings are of the biggest hummingbird? <laughs> I don't, but <laughs> research question. I love it, challenge. It's off the giant hummingbird. But that's one of those moments that hopefully it spurred an interest for you and you're going to do research. Such a great idea. Uh, what about their lifespan? How long do these? I was wondering if that one was going to come up. Um, typically, ironically, I think the females live a little bit longer, they believe. But again, how do we know this information? It's from birds that have been recaptured from being banned. So the males, they are doing so much and expending so much energy that they typically live between three to five years is the guess. The females typically five years is the guess, but it's based on 
the knowledge that we have. That said, um, up in uh, Crested Butte, there is some fantastic research that's been going on there for decades. And they had a recapture of a female who was 10, had been banded 10 years before. Wow. So, and when she was banded, she was not a nestling. So the guess was, was she extremely lucky? Or have the estimates been slightly incorrect? So we just don't know. We just need more scientific research. So all of these kiddos who are watching this, we need you to become orth ornithologists. Love it. How do they, um, Mary wants to know how they actually catch the hummingbirds for the banding process. Um, I actually have a picture. We use um, cages. We had some wonderful banders. Uh, that you can, most birds are caught with mist nets. So it's a net with very thin netting material and they will put it across a field so the birds will fly into it. The banders will quickly go in and handle them so they're not damaged. We will put a cage around feeders and we'll get the hummingbirds used to going in and out of these uh, cages. They don't care as long as they can maneuver. And then the day of the banding, we will have doors that magically shut. And then we go in and basically do hummingbird rodeo. And the, they look very fragile, but these uh, birds are more like football players with all of the muscles they have. Wow. You have to be extremely careful, but you would hold the hummingbird. And here we have a hummingbird getting it. It's like a watch that is put on it, but it has numbers. And here you can see how small the band is. And here is the hummingbird. And they are weighed and their beaks and everything is measured. We are looking to see whether it's a female, a male, um, whether it's a fledgling. And that band is put on to the bird. And that way, if it's recaptured in Mexico or in areas of Texas, wherever, we can all have data on where that bird has been. And the, you would think that this would be a hugely traumatic thing for these birds. Um, when we have done it, and we have had so many birds there, we've actually had to mark their foreheads because you can't see if they have a band on them until you're holding them. And often the birds would immediately go back into the feeder a few minutes later. So we had the mark on their head. We knew that they had already been banded and we could let them go. So uh, I don't know, maybe the birds slightly enjoyed the attention. I'm not sure. Brenda, do you have time for a few more questions? They just have so many great questions. Um, how many colors can one bird have? That is another research question for all of you. And Love it. as I said, there's many different kinds of hummingbirds. So the colors are going to vary hugely. Uh, some of the pictures that I showed earlier just on the females, which in theory are, are more dull, had beautiful greens and yellows and browns, and it depends on the lighting. Remember their colorings are iridescent. So just like on a soap bubble, it's going to, as the light changes, the colors are going to change. How do they sleep? <laughs> they will find a quiet spot, kind of hidden, and they'll kind of poof up. Um, I have a picture. So I mentioned earlier that in the springtime or any time in Colorado, we can get snow or at least temperatures that drop. And so if you think of birds that are here during the winter time, uh, like a chickadee, if they poof up their body like this, they have down feathers. And when they put air between those down feathers, it actually holds heat. This, these are pictures of hummingbirds that are conserving their energy because the temperature was dropping. And when a hummingbird does this, because they don't have those same type of feathers, they're actually releasing heat and they're allowing their body to go into what's called a torpor. So it's kind of like a little bit of a bird coma. So they will do this only when they have to conserve energy. Sadly, the females can't do this when they're sitting on a net because if they have to, the eggs are not going to survive. 
So when they do this, they're very vulnerable to anything that wants to come by and chomp them because they cannot wake up super fast. So when they, they look like a little ball of fluff right there. So that is only out of necessity, but otherwise they are going to be um, finding just a quiet spot and just kind of shut down for the night. And then as soon as, especially on cold mornings like this, they're gonna wake up and they're gonna immediately head to the flowers to get that sugar water. Um, reminded me to talk about that our hummingbirds in Colorado on average weigh this much. And when hopefully they've eaten enough and they're ready to migrate again back to those areas in Mexico, they typically weigh this much. Oh my goodness. Little marshmallows. They are kind of chunky when they're ready to leave. Hopefully they've eaten enough. But get yourself a penny and a nickel and feel the weight difference. Um, feel how light a penny is. That is so crazy and they're bigger than a penny. So <laughs> quite the weight distribution there. Well, excellent. Well, there's a lot of great questions coming in. Um, you, we did send out yesterday uh, a fact sheet that you all should have gotten um, if you RSVP'd for the event. So there's a PDF that has a fact sheet with lots of great information. Uh, it sounds like Brenda is challenging you to do some of your own research as well, which is so- Quality fun. websites, please. Quality websites, that's, that's very important. So I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Is there any last thoughts, Bre uh, Brenda, before we- we call it a program. Just a reminder that you now have the job to go out and teach others. That is your job. There's a lot of misinformation. People will say if you don't take your feeder down by a certain time, those hummingbirds are going to stay and they're going to die in the winter. And my uh, words to that is if it's the fledgling who's never left Colorado, obviously, and he's going to somehow make it to Mexico um, without a map, they certainly don't need us humans to tell us tell them they need to leave. So we as humans can support these birds doing much more responsible things, you know, making sure the habitat stays as nice as it can be, supporting any efforts for that, making sure your feeders are taken care of, encouraging your neighbors to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. Um, yeah, and just do proper research, share your knowledge. Well, thank you so much, Brenda. And as a reminder, come back this time next year, right? <laughs> Was that a hummingbird? Are you hearing that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do come back this time next year um, and check out the Hummingbird Festival. We're so sad to not have this this year, but such a fabulous presentation to learn more. Um, we hope everybody has a great rest of your weekend. We are going to make this video available. Um, we will be sending it out uh, probably early next week. So if you want to share this, please do. Thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you, Tori. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Tori and Lisa for helping. And thank yes, you, Lisa. And you have a ton of thank yous on the, on the chat as well, Brenda. They loved your talk. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.